This morning we're continuing in our series of living life in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this morning we're going to be covering Romans chapter 1 verses 1, sorry, Romans chapter 3 verses 1 through 18. But before we read God's word, let's stop and ask him to speak through his word to our hearts. Amen. And as always, we want to stop and pray and ask God to bless a local Thai church or a local international church, just a local church here in Thailand that's in our area, that's meeting right now. And so this morning, submitted by you, I'd like us to pray for Sprout Church. What a great name, Sprout Church. And we want to ask God to bless Pastor Pai and speak through him as well. Let's pray this morning. God, we come before you hungry, anxiously waiting to hear you speak today. God, you've got a message from your word for us. Your your word is timeless. Your word is living and active right now and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to separate bone and marrow, soul and spirit, even down to the depths and the intentions of our hearts, God. And that That word has a name, and his name is Jesus. So Jesus, would you speak to us today? Let us have the opportunity to sit at your feet and know that we met with Almighty God and his Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that for ourselves and for Sprout Church, God, that they may be, as their name implies, Father, reborn, born anew in you, and now growing, producing fruit that also sprouts to new life. Be with Pastor Pai, Father. Speak through him. Let your word not return to you void, but God, may it accomplish the purpose for which you've sent it. It's in the name of Jesus we ask. Amen and amen. Have you ever heard something that got you so mad you didn't know what to do? I have. I was actually in church. I won't say where. But my family and I were in church, in a church we don't usually go to. And the pastor opened up the Bible and read a few verses. And then he shut the Bible and never opened it again. And began to preach the exact opposite of what God's Word just clearly said. And I got so mad. (laughs) I didn't know what to do. I started crying and shaking. My children still remember to this day, oh, that's the place where dad cried in church. Second place, they weren't there at our wedding. But anyway, I can say that my wife's here and not in Sunday school this time. But Have you ever heard something that so offended you and riled you up that you didn't know what to do? I believe as we come to Romans chapter 3, that's exactly what the Jewish readers are hearing and feeling. So much so that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul stops and does like a mini dialogue. He's been teaching over and over and over truths. But he got to the point in Romans chapter 2 verse 25 that says, For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Now circumcision for a Jew meant identity, involvement, Belonging, promises, the covenant of God given to Father Abraham and all his descendants. And for Paul to write, and your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. This must have got him hot under the collar. Mad. Because what Paul is saying is, if you sin against God, then your circumcision, your identity as a Jew is worthless. It's the same as if you were an unwashed heathen Gentile. That must have got him mad. And then in verses 28 and 29, Paul writes, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. That means not by the letter of the law, in obedience to the law. His praise is not from man, but from God. And as a Jew, 
They must have got really offended. How can you say I am no longer a Jew if I have outward circumcision? What is this circumcision of the heart that only God does? Paul ends it with these words. His commandment, his praise is not from man, but from God. It doesn't matter what you think, Paul writes. It doesn't matter what I think. It only matters what God thinks. And God has said, in order to be righteous before me, you must be circumcised in your heart, not just physically. How can circumcision become meaningless would be the thought of the Jew. And if circumcision is meaningless, and Jews can now be judged right alongside those heathen, sinful, filthy, wicked Gentiles, then what good is it to be a Jew at all? What good is circumcision at all? And these are the very questions that Paul writes in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. We're going to go all the way to 18, but we're going to stop right now and just read verses 1 through 8. Read this with me. But think about, not just from our perspective in the Western church or in the Southeast Asian church, but in a Jewish understanding, an offended one at that. Romans chapter 3, starting with verses 1 and through 8. And what advantage has a Jew? What is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. But what if some were unfaithful? Does that their, unfa- their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Stop there for a moment. That's a lot to unpack. Amen? Some of us just read through that and said, okay, I understood every word, but I don't understand what he's saying. And so God's going to have us unpack this over several weeks because right here we have five groups of questions. Five little couplets of questions with a question and an answer and a question and a brief answer and a question. And honestly, this morning, in the time that we have, we're only going to be able to cover two of those questions at the beginning. Because the next three, Paul answers all the way through chapter 6. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to break down these questions as we dig deep into the Word of God. But let's look at verse 1 and this first question. The question that every Jew would have asked. And I believe Paul gets these questions not just from the Holy Spirit, but also from his memory. Because remember when Paul began to teach the gospel in the synagogues throughout the Roman world, he met a lot of opposition. And I believe these questions came from many sources when he began to teach on the need for faith in Jesus Christ, the need for circumcision of the heart. Verse 1, Then what advantage has a Jew? What's the value of circumcision? In other words, if Jews, who are God's chosen people, weren't chosen to automatically enter his kingdom through circumcision, through this covenant with him, why did God choose them? And why did he set them apart from all the other peoples in the world by the mark of circumcision? What advantage has a Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Well, let's look at what Paul says in verse 2. Much in every way. There's a lot of advantage to being a Jew, To begin with, here's the first reason, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Stop there. Because this is one of the more important answers that we're going to hear this morning. You, Jews, received the oracles of God. What's an oracle? It simply means utterance. Literally, the word means utterance. Word. Spoken. But look at what Paul is saying. In the first place... You received more revelation light from God on who He is and what He is like and what He expects than anyone else in the whole world. You received God's Word. 
Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. He's been revealing himself, Paul says in chapter 1 and chapter 2, through creation. He's been revealing himself through our consciences and the law written on our hearts. He says, but you Jews, you didn't get this little bit of light from creation in your conscience. No, you got a one billion lumens spotlight from God. Declaring who he is. He's with you. He rescued you. He walked you through from Egypt all the way to the promised land. As a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. He was there in his presence and he spoke with you on the mountain. He spoke with you in the tabernacle. He gave you his own law. Of course that makes you more special, more unique, more chosen than anyone else. Of course that gives you an advantage. And so what Paul's going to do now is use this idea of let's go look at the scripture that God has given you to answer these next four groups. Because his first answer right here is this. You received God's word. Now before we continue, I want you to understand the specialness of God's word. Because many of us are reading God's word right now on some sort of device or maybe even a book. And if you're not, let me encourage you to follow along with God's word as we study together. The verses that we're covering are going to be right there. But God's Word is more than just an app on our devices. It's the very communication of God to us. I was talking with some good friends recently, and they were talking about how we feel this and we feel that, and the end result was, you know what, feelings are great, but if we're not focusing what our feelings are by the Word of God, we can be led astray. We're not focusing our understanding of the way things are by the Word of God. We can be led astray. The Word of God is not just an app. It's important. And look what God did in giving the Jews His Word. Why did He give them the Word in the first place? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. God tells the Jews why he gave his law. He says, see, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me. This is God speaking through Moses to the people. That you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it as you enter into the promised land. Keep them and do them for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. For when they hear all these statutes, they will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord God is near to us? Whenever we call on him, he's there. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous so as all this law that I've set before you today? God says, I'm giving you the law, Jews. I've set you apart for this reason. I've even given you circumcision to set you apart as a special people so that people will know you are the people of God. That anybody who looks at you and sees your life and living the law and sharing the law and walking with God in his law, they're going to say three things. They're going to say, wow, there's no people like the people of God, the Jews. They're different from everybody else. And there's no law so perfect that anybody else lives by but this law that they received from God. And there's no God like the God who walks with Israel. See, the reason God gave the Jews, chose the Jews, set them apart, even marked them so they would be different, was so that his word would be spread, and everyone would know this was the word of God. That he would be glorified by choosing them. These are the oracles of God, the utterances that they had. They've been given to them. And we should never undervalue the fact that we have that same utterance of God. Amen? It should be used as an app on our phone more often maybe than those other games we play. Because it's that important. And so Paul says, what's the reason, the advantage of Jews? You've got a bunch of opportunities and reasons and advantage. But let me just tell you the most important one, the first one. You have been given revelation of who God is. In a way nobody else has. You've been given the oracles of God. It's almost like Jesus chiding Nicodemus in John chapter 3 verse 10. Where Jesus says, hey, you're a teacher of the law. You're a teacher of Israel. Yet you don't understand what I'm sharing with you. Everything I'm saying is already in the Old Testament. You don't understand. 
So the first question and answer is, why are the Jews special? Why was circumcision special? It set them apart as the people of God who had God's law. And they had a relationship with the only true God. There's much we could say about that, but we're going to go to the second question because I think this is what God wants us to hear this morning. Let's look at the second group now in verses 3 and 4. What if some were unfaithful, Paul asks. We're back in Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Paul says, by no means. Let God be true and everyone a liar, as it is written, though you may be justified in your works and prevail when you are judged. Okay, let me explain what they're asking here, this question, because it may be a little confusing. They're saying, what if some of the Jews were unfaithful? Does their unfaithfulness change God's predetermined promises? Or let me put it in another way. Does the sinfulness of man change the plan of God? That's what they're asking. See, because God gave all these promises through the covenant to the Jews. And they were unfaithful. And now Paul is saying circumcision means nothing. It's been nullified if you break the law as well. And they're saying, but wait a minute. We have all these promises from God and circumcision is a sign of this covenant. If that, our sin causes this to change, does that mean God's perfect plan? His promises are null and void too? Can man's sin change God's plan? What if some were unfaithful? It's a great question, isn't it? And it's a question that's being bantered around in seminaries and churches throughout the world. And there through the minds of the Jews as well. Does the sinfulness of man change the plan of God? We can understand where they're coming from. Go to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. We're going to read when the covenant of circumcision was given. When Abram was 99 years old, there in 17 verse 1, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant after which you shall keep it, between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. See all the promises that God made? Here's my covenant. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to give you the land. And so their question is, but did our unfaithfulness, if some were unfaithful, does it change the faithfulness of God? Does it nullify his faithfulness? Does he not keep his promises? Now, later on, Paul is going to address the fact that circumcision was never the way through righteousness, that it was always by faith, that Father Abraham was given righteousness by faith even before the law was given. Circumcision wasn't the absolute ticket into the kingdom of God. It's not by works. But we have to wrestle with this question. What if some were unfaithful? Does it nullify the faithfulness of God? Or let me put it in modern terms so we know what we're talking about. Because we're talking about salvation here. Does the free will of man change God's predetermined will? So what does Paul say? 
Paul quotes a psalm that was written a thousand years even before his letter. Go to Psalm 51 and look at what the Apostle Paul says. This is the verse in the psalm he's quoting. To the choir master, a psalm of David. This is the, the, the title that's there in the psalm. When Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done evil what is in your sight, done what is evil in your sight, look, and this is what Paul quotes, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Let's keep reading. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit in me. This is the passage that Paul is pointing to. But how does that answer the question? Well, let's look what David is saying. David is saying this. Go ahead and look at those verses again, and I'm going to paraphrase it for you as we skim through. Everything about me is sin, David says. I am filthy with iniquity. My sin is everywhere I look, and I am rightfully deserving of your wrath and your judgment, O God. You are right to condemn me. You are blameless in your judgment. That's the Hebrew text. Paul quotes the Septuagint, but the words mean the same thing. None can declare you as being unjust, O God. I have always been filled with sin, even from my birth. And there is nothing good in me. To be absolutely truthful, we don't like to think in these terms. There's nothing good in us. We think our hearts are good. We as humans think everything is good. I was talking to a friend just, just yesterday, I believe it was, or the day before yesterday. And he said, you know, I just saw a, there's a Bible company writing a new Bible, and the name of the Bible was the Follow Your Heart Bible. And David says, I'm seeped in sin. You squish me, sin comes out. I am wretched before God. We like to think that we're okay. But this is what David is saying over and over and over again. There's no good in me. There's only good in you, God. Everything in me is sin. And then he cries out something else. He says, God, I need you. If you don't show me mercy and blot out my transgressions, if you don't wash me of my iniquity and cleanse me of my sin, if you don't purge me with hyssop and wipe your blood on the doorposts of my heart, that's the hyssop reference there when they're exiting Egypt, if you don't wash me whiter than snow, if you don't hide your face from my sins, if you don't blot out all my iniquities from your book, and if you don't act and you don't create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me, I am undone. I can do nothing. It's not that I have sinned against you, God. I am sin before you. Everything good is you, God, and everything evil is me. And that's Paul's point. That's the answer to the question of what if some are unfaithful? Go back to Romans chapter 3 now and see how Paul explains that's exactly what he's saying when we go to verses 9 through 18. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 18 now. What then? Are we Jews better off? No, not at all. We're better off in that God gave us the law, but with respect to salvation and forgiveness and righteousness before God, we are not better off. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not 
even one. And their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. What Paul is doing is he is quoting scripture after scripture after scripture. He's quoting Deuteronomy, he's quoting Psalms, he's quoting Exodus, he's quoting Jeremiah, he's quoting Isaiah and others. And saying, this is the truth. Jew, you're wondering, what if some were unfaithful? Does that nullify the faithfulness of God? And the answer is, there's no such thing. All are unfaithful. I saw something that was sent on Social media this morning, it was perfect. It's an R.C. Sproul's quote. People, we ask, why do bad things happen to good people? And R.C. Sproul says, well, honestly, that only happened once, and he volunteered for it. There's only one good, and that was Jesus Christ. And he died willingly. There's no such thing as a good person. No one seeks after God. No one wants to be with God. And when they revealed to God the light of God, they run away. And Paul says, what if some are unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true, though everyone a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you're judged. Here's the truth. Only God is true. Everyone is a liar. Every man, every woman, every child has sinned before God and stands in judgment. Don't worry about what if some are unfaithful because God already knew we all are unfaithful. And that is the miracle of the gospel. The miracle of the gospel is that anyone gets saved because none of us deserve it. The Jews were so unfaithful that we don't even get out of the law. We don't even get out of the book of Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy 31 in the time that we have left. I know we're running short. Look at Deuteronomy 31 verses 28 and 29. We don't even get out of the law. And Moses, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking to the people and saying, you guys aren't going to stay with God. I already know it. Look at this, Deuteronomy 31, verse 28. Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, Moses said, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death, you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I've commanded you. In the days to come, evil will befall you because you will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. You will provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. We don't even get out of the law. And God is already telling through Moses, you guys are sinful. The reason I'm giving you the law is not to make you righteous. We'll see later on. The reason God gave us the law is to show us just how unrighteous we are. That's why God told the prophet Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. Who can understand? Stand it. Let me paint you a brief word picture to help you just wrap your mind around this. Spiritually speaking, according to what we just read, we are all cockroaches. Have you ever walked into a room infested by cockroaches and turned the light on? What happens? They scatter. They're not like spiders. Oh, no, I don't like spiders. Spiders will stop there and look at you. And if you stare looking at them, they start doing this. <laughs> oh, come on, bring it. But not a cockroach. Cockroach, you turn the light on, they're gone. Why? They hate the light. They love the darkness. And that's what Jesus said. The judgment of the world has come. And here's the judgment. The light has come into the world, yet man loves darkness. They reject the light. We are all, spiritually speaking, cockroaches, which makes the gospel so amazing that anyone gets saved. Because the truth of the gospel is this. Without God acting first, we will not be saved. God needs to step in, and God is the God who did that. 
God stepped in when we needed him most. God is the one who sent his son to die for us on the cross while we were still enemies of him. And God is the one who chooses us first. Because if God didn't choose us first, as we just read in Romans chapter 3, we will always turn away from God. We never seek God. We don't care. The fear of God is not before them. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Which is why we need to understand that in the gospel, it is God who acts first. If God had not opened our blind eyes and drew us to himself through the finished work of his son on the cross, we would never choose him. We wouldn't even be able to stop running away from the light. Pursuing the darkness, not wanting to face his judgment. It's not in my notes, but in Revelation, we see that when Jesus Christ comes back and the whole world sees him, the kings of the earth do what? They cry out, O oh, rocks, fall on us. We want to hide in the darkness, even if it crushes us. We do not want to face the light. Look at John 15, 16. I know this is hard for us to grasp. And we're going to get to that in a moment. But I, you have to understand that this part of the gospel is very important for us to, stand, to, to really grasp and understand. We're not just mildly bad and God died for us and he just forgave us and, and that's okay. Let's go on with life. No, we were wretched and poor and without him and helpless before him. And God acted first and chose to save us. John 15, verse 16, Jesus just got done saying, I no longer call you friends, I no longer call you servants, but now I call you friends. Why? Because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but a friend knows what his master, because his master's telling him what he's doing, and the very next verse Jesus says is, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. There's a tension here, isn't there? There's a struggle. There's a wrestling. Because on one side, we see Jesus saying, uh, whoever comes to the light, it'll be seen that they are in the light, and we're going to be judged. This is the judgment on whether or not we respond to the light, whether or not we respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then on the other side, we see God has to act first or else no one would respond. So which is it? Is it man's choice or is it God's choice? And the answer is yes. There's a tension there. One person put it this way. There are two tracks we see in the Scripture. God has to choose or else no one gets saved. We're responsible for choosing. And like two tracks of a train, if you lean to one side to try to lift the tires off that other track, you're going to fall over and crash. Right now, throughout the world, there's a bunch of arguments. And, and what I've heard one person say, isms cause schisms. Where we're fighting over what is right and what is wrong, and we're trying to lean our train. The truth of the matter is, the tension is there. The same God that writes in Romans chapter 11, God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Let me read that again. God has consigned all to disobedience, we're all sinners, that he may have mercy on all, is the same God that wrote in Acts 13, and when the Gentiles heard that they could be saved from the gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So which is it? Yes. One of the most well-quoted verses in all of Scripture, and the least believed I'm going to start it and see if you guys can finish it. Ready? For the Lord said, my ways are, say it louder, for my ways are what? Higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We know this, but we don't believe it because we try to put God in a box. The tension is there. 
And we'll never understand it because we're not God. As the rain falls from the heavens, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts and my ways higher than your ways. What God wants the Jews to understand in this point right here is that their question on whether or not God is faithful isn't really a question because God already knew that they were full of sin. And God still saves and he still chooses. Jesus Christ chooses. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, if you took the Lord's Supper because you knew that you knew that you are saved, praise the Lord God chose you. And our response to that choosing is what? Gratitude. Because a cockroach can never become a child of the king unless the king makes him so. Our response just needs to be praise. I'm sure that when Jesus said, follow me, and the disciples followed him, they felt that they were freely choosing. But yet all along, Jesus turns to them and says, I chose you first. Look at Jeremiah 14, and we'll close. Our God is a God who chooses. Sorry, not Jeremiah 14, Jeremiah 1, 4 through 9. And that last verse is our benediction. Listen to the heart of God. The same God who told Jeremiah right, Jeremiah, right, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? God, that same God says, now the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, God says. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. To deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand, and the Lord touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Do you see it? Our attitude before God should be just complete and utter gratitude for his mercy. We don't deserve this love, this merciful, sovereign God. Sovereign means he's in control of everything, yet he is still merciful to us who don't deserve it. Jeremiah says, God knew me before I was born because God told me this. And he chose me and appointed me and he's with me and he's protecting me and he is rescuing me and he's the one who's letting me do his will with his power through me, even to the point of giving me every word that he wants me to say. We're never going to be able to understand. We just need to accept we are responsible for our responses for, before God. But understand this. Our response should be thanksgiving. We never deserved it. Yet God, through his infinite love, saved us. Let's pray. Father, this is deep theology. And God, we as people, we don't like it when we can't understand and we want to make it all work out. But God, you yourself have said that your thoughts are greater than ours. And that how can you choose while we still are responsible for choosing and responding to your light, even though you're the one who, God, it's just impossible for us to understand. And you tell us, yes, that's true. Because we're not you. So God, help us to receive your truth and the realization that you are ever faithful. That if we are with you, you keep us faithful. And if we are unfaithful, you are always faithful because you will never deny yourself because you are God. Father, thank you for being faithful even when we aren't. And thank you for working this all out according to your glory. And Father, help us to have the response that you commanded of your disciples. You have chosen us for one purpose, to walk with you, abide in you, that you may bear fruit 
in us. God, if there's anything that's in our garden that's stopping your fruit being flowing through us, sprouting through us like the Sprout Church, God, take it away that we may be people who are filled with gratitude towards you and mercy towards others. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.